Community Television. I'm your host, Adam Cook. This week, we're once again going around the Richmond County Council table as we review two presentations made at the recent Committee of the Whole Meeting for Council in Arishat. In just a couple of minutes' time, you're going to hear from Terry Smith. He's the CEO for Cape Breton's biggest tourism lobby group, the Destination Cape Breton Association. Smith appeared before the Committee of the Whole Meeting earlier this month to get Richmond Councilors' opinions on proposed changes to the Cape Breton marketing levy that's charged to anyone that books in at accommodations big and small across Cape Breton Island. But we begin with an update on the strategic planning exercise that Richmond Council has been going through over the past couple of months. The committee of the whole meeting from earlier in September heard from two members of the organization that's been contracted to do the plan, specifically preferred choice development strategists. In just a couple of minutes, you're going to hear from David Patterson and kicking things off, James Lear, who appeared before the council meeting via Zoom, not only to update how strategic planning is going in Richmond County, but also to talk a bit about some population and demographic shifts in the county that could impact how we live our lives over the next little while with or without a new approval for the strategic plan that's been put forward by the company. Here is James Lear setting it all up for us. I'm going to start off with uh, uh, updated demographics based on the 2021 census. And I think as uh, council and administration's aware, modest population change uh, in the municipality to 8,914 uh, as of the uh, 2021 census count. But the, the main thing that I always indicate is uh, when one takes a look at it, you can see the age distribution has more of an older population uh, compared to younger folks. And similarly on the uh, graphic on the right hand side is an overlay for the province of Nova Scotia. And again, you can see the differences in uh, percentage of population by age uh, being predominantly older uh, in Richmond County than the province. So the strategic plan refreshment process included taking a look at secondary information, a community survey that was open for I think about three months, community and stakeholder engagement that occurred with a number of virtual stakeholder meetings uh, in March and April with some additional meetings uh, in May as well as some public meetings that occurred in June uh, in person and uh, in addition to that some planning meetings with council to guide the strategic plan refresh process. The refresh included the development of the uh, refresh strategic plan, that stakeholder engagement, uh, participation in key consultations, uh, the uh, information review, a strategic SWOT analysis, and of course a uh, delivered refresh copy of the strategic plan uh, that was provided at the end of August to the municipality. Some of the themes that were observed in engaging the community included economic growth, tourism activity, recreation and leisure services, quality of life, infrastructure and transportation, uh, the importance of community engagement and involvement, municipal leadership and access to services. And it's these themes that help form part of the refresh of the strategic plan. In total, 124 people completed the online survey, 11 people attended three in-person events, 70 people attended three virtual events, and uh, there were some uh, emails received and five stakeholder meetings held with about 20 uh, participants as part of the planning process. The strategic planning format uh, covers off a mission statement, goals, objectives, strategies, and an action plan under an overlying vision for the community. So in, part, in discussions with council and based on the information had 
and the uh, in-person consultations, the following has been presented as a proposed new uh, revised vision for the uh, strategic plan re refresh, and that is a destination rich in history with a future of growth. The updated mission statement is to provide efficient and effective municipal services and actively engaging with the business community, residents, and partners to facilitate growth and a high quality of life. There were four goals uh, that were uh, prepared as part of the strategic plan refresh. One, to grow the economy. Two, to invest in infrastructure. Three, to nurture quality of life. Four, to lead and engage stakeholders. And under each one of those goals, a number of objectives were identified. So under the Grow the Economy goal, objectives include advanced development in industrial parks, facilitate business and investment attraction, support business retention and growth, advocate for tourism development to build up 12-month tourism experiences, develop a branding strategy and champion promotion of area destinations. Under the invest in infrastructure goal, objectives were implement long-term capital planning for sound fiscal management, continue to deliver and protect quality water and sewer services and resources, build up funding for facilities renewal, develop and improve accessible sidewalks, pathways, and corridors, champion broadband and cell service expansion. Under the Nurture Quality of Life goal, objectives include utilize an accessibility and age-friendly approach to all services, projects, and initiatives, support and build and enhance spaces for, wellness, for health and wellness, Encourage housing development across the housing continuum. Address climate change across the county. Ensuring a welcoming experience that values equity, diversity, and inclusion. Under the lead and engage stakeholders goal, objectives were adopt and implement a communications plan and policy and continue to inform and involve citizens and stakeholders in a variety of ways. Support and connect citizens and volunteer groups. Seek and sustain collaborations with organizations in a variety of areas to pursue shared goals. Foster strong and consistent relationships with other local governments, such as Bottle First Nation and St. Peter's Village Commission. Find and leverage funding supports in areas including infrastructure renewal, roads, trails, sustainability, housing, accessibility, and tourism. And from that, a number of indicators were identified that could be helpful in the process of advancing the plan and looking at its progress. And from there, the adopted refresh strategic plan will achieve success by having a strong framework that is implemented monitored, reported, reviewed, adjusted, and renewed going forward. So I think for this item, um, at this stage, councillors would be, probably be looking for a motion to approve the strategic plan. Um, and we may just need someone to kind of hang up that again. Um, so that we can take that forward and ratify it at our September regular council meeting at the end of the month. In the end, Richmond Municipal Councillors voted unanimously to accept the strategic plan's draft form at this committee of the whole meeting. It will go to a final vote when Richmond Municipal Councillors hold their regular meeting in just a few days' time on the evening of Monday, September 26th in Arishat. And now we're going to hear from Terry Smith, the CEO for Cape Breton's largest tourism lobby group, Destination Cape Breton Association. He showed up at the Richmond Municipal Building in Arishat many times over the last few years, but this time around, Smith wasn't just giving an update on how tourism has gone in Cape Breton over the past summer. He was asking for councillors' opinions on the Cape Breton marketing levy. 
It's been in effect for many years, and it's bundled into the price charged by people doing everything from renting hotel rooms for the night to checking in at a bed and breakfast in a small community. Smith wanted to get Richmond councillors' opinions on proposed changes to the levy, not just at the municipal level, but also at the provincial government level. So here is Terry Smith's presentation to Richmond Council's Committee of the Whole right now. So just a uh, background for, for all of you. Um, the Cape Breton Island marketing levy was legislated by the province in 2011 uh, with the Cape Breton Island Marketing Levy Act. And then uh, once passed by the province, uh, each of the five municipalities on the island uh, implemented uh, municipal bylaws. The bylaws are almost identical, uh, so, so, the, uh, so it's consistent uh, how it's applied across the island. Uh, right now, there's a 2% uh, rate charged on fixed roof accommodation stays at properties with 10 rooms or more, uh, longer term stays of 30 days or more, uh, medical stays, students in dorms, they're all exempt from being charged the levy. And the Act states that the funds must be used to promote Cape Breton Island as a tourism destination. So at the time uh, that was put in place, there was a memorandum of understanding that was uh, established with all five municipalities that uh, designated uh, our organization, Destination Cape Breton, as the official agency to uh, promote the island. So how it works basically is uh, our, our accommodation operators that have 10 rooms or more, they charge the levy to their guests, they collect the, the funds, remit it to their respective municipalities, and then the municipalities provide the funds to us and we use it to promote the island. So pretty simple. So I wanted to get into a little bit uh, about uh, results. Um, and this is going back, so the levy uh, was, uh, the act was passed in 2011. The first year of, of collection and usage of the funds was 2012. And, um, and I've just taken this up to uh, 2019, the last year before the pandemic, because the pandemic kind of uh, threw everything for a loop in terms of the levy. The, the Those revenues were, were really depressed. Hopefully they're coming back this year. Um, but um, in everything that we do, almost everything that we do to promote the island, we're trying to drive people to our website, visitcapebreton.com, where they can learn about things to do, places to stay, um, and and all the reasons to, to visit the island. And, um, and so, Traffic to that website is an indicator of, of the progress of, of that marketing uh, investment. So for the first three years, we had the levy in place. Um, because the budget was uh, modest at the time, it was decided to only market within the Maritimes. So you can see uh, in the area shaded by blue um, from 2012 to 2014, um, there's modest uh, traffic being generated coming to the website. In 2015, we uh, made the decision to go into Ontario and Quebec. 2016, we added Northeast US. And from that period on, you see a, a steady incline. And that, uh, beyond 2019, the traffic has continued to grow. Last year, uh, we hit a record level, uh, over a million uh, sessions on our website. This year, we've actually it uh, already surpassed all of last year. So, so we're going to have uh, a, a really big year in terms of traffic to the site. So that, that's in terms of uh, the efforts of the marketing to get people to our website, but is that converting them to visits? So looking at that, we can look at room nights sold on the island as, as one of our major indicators. Same sort of thing in the blue, uh, you can see um, in the, the three years where we were marketing to the Maritimes only, there's kind of steady, gradual increases. Uh, 2015, we go into Ontario and Quebec, another uh, increase there. Uh, and then it really uh, took a, a good incline over the next couple of years. Um, and so the green bar, that's licensed uh, accommodations. That's, they're licensed by the province. But then also there's down the bottom, there's the blue bars which is short-term rentals, shared economy. So that's Airbnb and Verbo units, mainly Airbnb. Um, so if you take a look at 2018 and 2019, it looks like the licensed accommodations uh, declined in those years. But what was really happening is that more people were booking Airbnbs 
and they were getting an increasingly larger share of the accommodation market. So, uh, so if you combine the two, there's a little bit of duplication, not very much, but if you combine the two, there would be increases in those years as well. Um, and just over that period, 2012 to 2019, just to give you a comparison, um, when we measure using 2011 as a baseline, we measure the incremental room nights sold, the growth relative to where we were in 2011. Um, you can see that our growth more than doubled the province overall. So, um, so a positive sign. The levy has been working, and um, here's we have an estimate that basically for every uh, dollar collected by the, the levy, there's about twenty-seven dollars generated in visitor spending. So a, a good ROI. But we have a situation. So our current situation, um, when the levy was formed at the time, uh, we had Enterprise Cape Breton Corporation here on the island, and um, ECBC, as, as we called them, they, at the time, formed an agreement with Destination Cape Breton, whereby they would match the levy funds up to $640,000 a year. Uh, that was the cap. So that agreement continued and was in place ECBC folded, uh, their, um, their role was taking o taken over by ACOA on the island. ACOA honored that agreement for a, a few years, but in 2019 they signaled to us that they were going to have to uh, start reducing the amount of funding. And, it, and it's basically because we, we had a, a bit of a, a sweetheart deal, I guess you could call it, uh, because Enterprise Cape Breton was able to give us uh, a better deal than most other destinations would get throughout Atlantic Canada. So they said, we've got to start reducing that. So um, this year, uh, we're at, at 440000 is their level of funding. Next year, it's going to be three forty, And then the year after that, they've told us it will level off at 300000 a year. So a $340,000 hit, uh, if you look at that. And, and that hit will be every year uh, as we go forward. Uh, and at the same time, as I showed you on the room night sold chart, uh, the Airbnb and Verbo rentals, uh, they grew from 7% of registered room nights sold to last year they were 30%. Um, and they're, they're at record levels this year as well. So it may even be higher again uh, this year. And the thing is, most of them are smaller accommodations, very few, with very few exceptions, they are not collecting the levy. Um, so those factors, and then of course the pandemic, as I mentioned, have driven the levy revenues down, what we have to work with. So um, since ACOA told us in 2019 that we were going to have to uh, uh, deal with these cuts, uh, we looked at, well, what can we do to, uh, to mitigate uh, the, the impact of those cuts? So uh, we moved uh, our office into a former VIC building, a Visitor Information Center building, uh, which, which we actually, we own the building and we, we have a long-term lease on the land, uh, but basically it, it eliminated our, our rent costs. Gave us a little more overhead, but, but it, it was still a, a net positive for us. We had 11 full-time staff in 2019. We're uh, at uh, nine currently. Two are on uh, parental leave right now, so, so uh, we didn't really replace them with anyone, so we're, we're, we're dealing with uh, even, even less right now. We took some step, steps to uh, achieve organizational efficiencies using technology to work uh, smarter and more collaboratively, and uh, we've continually uh, honed and tweaked the marketing program to continue to deliver strong results despite the shrinking budget. So as I mentioned um, this year, um, uh, the, the traffic is, is uh, at record levels. Um, so right now we're at the point where we've, we feel we've made all the cuts that we can make. Um, and uh, as I showed, the levy, the marketing levy helped us have this decade of, of growth really. But we're heading for a cliff because now we still have to reduce our budget by $100,000 next year, which is significant for us and then another 40,000 the year after. And the only place to cut is in what we have for destination marketing. So that, that means that that could impact the impact we make from, from promoting the destination. 
So in, um, uh, in 2021, we, uh, we took a look at this. We consulted, uh, we, we hired a consultancy called uh, Floor 13. They're uh, a, a group that specializes in tourism and works with organizations like ours across Canada. And uh, we asked them to, uh, to uh, develop a, a revenue stream report for us. Basically, look at our revenue streams compare them to other organizations like us across the country, see is there any, any, uh, anywhere where we could learn from others and, and, uh, and uh, make changes. They basically came back to us and said um, they recommended increasing the marketing levy rate. And this is just a line from the recommendation. Even without the current income stream challenge faced by Destination Cape Breton, there's a multitude of benchmark evidence to suggest that the current 2% levy places the region at a competitive disadvantage to many of its competitor destinations. And here's what they mean by that. So this is Atlantic Canada, and this just shows you where the levies are at uh, as you move around the region. So we're at 2%. Halifax is also at 2%. In PEI, Summerside, and Charlottetown have a 3% levy. In New Brunswick, Moncton, Fredericton, St. John, 3.5%. Uh, there's a small one in, uh, in Gross Morn in Newfoundland at 3%, and then the lar largest in the region is St. John's uh, at 4%. And um, as of 2019, the average levy in Canada was 3.43%. So for us and Halifax, we are the lowest in the region, and we are also amongst the lowest in the country in terms of the levy rate. So in the spring, um, we conducted uh, a series of meetings with accommodation operators around the island, uh, 12 sessions and then uh, uh, Zoom as well. And um, we presented them with three options. The first one was increasing the levy rate to 3%. Halifax is also taking steps to move their rate to 3%, so we're moving in lockstep with them. We estimate this would add about $450,000 to our budget at 2019 levels. Um, but it does not uh, address the increasing um, share of the, the market that Airbnb and, and Verbo are, are getting. So it's, it's 450 right now that we estimate, but if they continue to get increasing marketing share, well, that, that could be less. Uh, option two was to apply the levy to all fixed roof operators. So, and there's a question of fairness in some communities, um, uh, you know, the, Port Hood, for example, is one community where um, House Troyberg is one, one accommodation, has seven rooms just up the street, Hillcrest Hall, 11 rooms. Hillcrest Hall has to charge the levy, and the other option just down the street, a competitor, doesn't. And so there's a question of fairness there. And the smaller operators do benefit from all the destination marketing that happens as well. So, um, so many of the larger operators uh, feel that everybody should be paying. Um, so we estimate this would add, uh, we, we don't have a lot of uh, great information on the Airbnb, so, so this is a rough estimate um, of about 250 to 350,000. So it might replace what we're losing from ACOA. Uh, it might fall a little bit short of that. But um, you, you could also say that it doesn't address that competitive uh, disadvantage that the consultants mentioned because other jurisdictions are 3% or more, and so we're kind of leaving money on the table. And then the third option was basically a combination of the two. So the feedback from the, those operators that, uh, that we consulted with, um, and, um, and by the way, we, we provided a summary report from those consultations that uh, uh, is available available on our, on our website. Basically, it's I'm summarizing it for you now, but but um, um, we're giving operators another opportunity to provide input if they weren't able to attend those sessions. So uh, so we're, we're we're making sure that we uh, do the due diligence that they feel that they've uh, had uh, opportunity to uh, to provide feedback. But the vast majority um, supported option three, increasing the levy to. Uh, rate to 3% as long as all fixed roof accommodations collect, including Airbnb and Verbo. Um, 
they had recommended not to rush into this, to look at a January 1st, 2024 start date. Some operators said they're already quoting 2023 mm -hmm. rates, so that, that only makes sense. Um, they also suggested that uh, sometimes, you know, to spend them, all of the marketing, the, the money on marketing may not be uh, the, the best approach because you can do all the great marketing in the world, but if people come here and uh, the operators don't have the workforce to deal with, uh, with all of those, vi those visitors, uh, that's an issue. So they suggested having some flexibility uh, to address other issues other than marketing like the workforce shortage. Um, and many felt that uh, Airbnb and Verbo, this is kind of separate from, from the levy issue, but um, many uh, uh, voiced their concerns that they need to be more regulated uh, to ensure a more level playing field and quality for guests and suggested starting the process now. Uh, and uh, as uh, Warden Mumbercat will recall, she and I, uh, co-hosted a number of sessions uh, around the island a couple of years ago, um, and uh, and this pe people are still echoing those same concerns that they did a couple of years ago for sure. So our proposed amendment is to do what they say, increase the rate to three percent. What what we'd suggest is that uh, the province instead of putting putting a, a limit on the rate. That, uh, that they give the municipalities, the five municipalities, the power to make future rate changes. Uh, now they might say that, well, that's within a range or, or whatever, but uh, just so that we don't have to go back to the province to change legislation if there's, there's a need for, for a rate change in the future. Um, we are promote, proposing to remove the 10 or more rooms threshold uh, and adopt the Tourism Registration Act de definition of fixed roof accommodations, and that would uh, include Airbnb and Verbo. Um, we'd also uh, propose that uh, the amendment uh, allow for funding to be used for destination management, as well as marketing uh, activities, such as addressing workforce issues, and as the operator suggested, a start date of January 1st, 2024. Do you have a breakdown of the people versus, like the Maritimes versus who's on your site in Ontario, Northeastern U.S.? Is there a breakdown there? Of, yeah. Because it, it has increased. Website? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, like, and, tell, and, it, and it's, it's been a little bit up and down, but uh, this year, Ontario is by far the, the number one market that, that we're seeing. Uh, Nova Scotia would be second. Um, Nova Scotia is down a little bit from last year, but last year we weren't marketing to Ontario and Quebec, so so um, or or not as much. Um, so so Nova Scotia we we place more resources behind Ontario and Quebec, and then Quebec is third. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of city, like uh, you can look at it from the cities. So the Greater Toronto area, um, Halifax, and the Greater Montreal area are the three biggest markets in terms of where our visitors come from. You commented that many felt that the Airbnb be more regulated. I would assume that the many people you were talking about would be the owners of the fixed roof um, accommodations of the 10 or more um, rooms. Yes, yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that the Airbnb owners don't feel that they uh, they should fall under that category. And I, and I ask, yeah. I only say that because um, I do know some of some Airbnb owners on the island, and uh, one of the difference that I guess you could bring back for the fixed roof accommodations would be property assessments. Um, I can tell you that people who live in their own home and have it as an Airbnb pay full value um, taxes for the property assessment, whereas um, a fixed room accommodation, such as a motel or whatever, uh, doesn't. So I don't know that uh, I am definitely on board with uh, the increase of the three percent. However, I would be uh, I would need a little more information on the breakdown between the Airbnb and the uh, Verbo versus the I guess the fixed roof. Yeah. So the, there were some operators uh, of Airbnb that were in our sessions, uh, and um, basically the the ones who were in our sessions anyway. Um, now, setting aside the regulations, and I, like I said, that's kind of a separate issue, um, but it's one that's persisting. And um, 
but uh, but those that were there, they they basically said, we totally agree. Like like we should be, we have no problem paying what what everybody else is paying. So I can't say if every we we don't have the contact information for all the Airbnb operators. So so it was only a portion of them. But uh, but you know from, from those I have talked talked to, yeah, they, they they basically said that that they don't see an issue and. Um, some jurisdictions in the country, um, it's mainly in Ontario, but um, they've also set it up so that uh, they have an agreement with Airbnb where Airbnb actually charges the guest mm -hmm. through the platform sure. and, then re and then provides it to the municipality directly. Um, that's something that we could work towards and then they don't even see it. Obviously, you, you have or will be presenting to the five municipalities. I guess my question is where are you in the in the circuit of sort of presenting this information to the other municipalities? You're first. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Inverness on Thursday, Victoria County next Monday, and uh, um, still waiting on uh, CBRM and Port Hawkesbury. Well, Port Hawkesbury is not till October, but CBRM, uh, I'm, I'm just waiting for them to confirm. But, um, but yeah, o over the next month or so, yeah. All the municipalities will, will be talked to. So given that this is something that's legislated by the province, obviously what you're looking for is um, is motions that support your yes. recommendation to the province to change the legislation. Yeah. Okay. So I think we have a little bit of time to, to, now that it's sort of, you've done your presentation, my feeling is, um, and that, you know, the public would be able to view it and, and understand it. Folks who maybe weren't in those working groups, if they're going to reach out, they're going to reach out to us in the next little bit. And we can maybe make a decision from there. If you haven't presented to everybody, it's not like you're waiting on our, on our motion to move towards. The no, office, no, right. And and um, and there's a process whereby, um, once it goes through the legislature, yeah, they, that anybody who wants to speak to right. it has that opportunity as well. Yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. And I think anything we would decide here this evening would have to be taken to our regular council meeting anyway. Of course. At the end yeah. of the month, right? So. Sure. So maybe we'll take this period of time to, to mm -hmm. kind of think about it. Yeah. Would it be okay if we kind of shared some of this information publicly? You know, like I mean, on Absolutely. our website to help you get yeah. the word out. Yep. Um, and that way, you know, this we can say this is what's being proposed, mm -hmm. and that way we will hear from folks if mm -hmm. they have concerns. I mean, I know, years ago when I was sort of Airbnb being before there was such a thing as Airbnb, that's how long ago it was, uh, you know, I, I would have relished, I think, an opportunity to be part of a destination marketing campaign, you know, like, and, and I think that's the, that's the upside of this right. kind of thing, that you can feature locations with these types of, yeah. um, these types of, uh, you know, marketing opportunities um, in a way that I never would have been able to afford on, on my own. So it's like yep. kind of be kind of being part of the larger collective, right? So it's it's exciting in that way, um, but certainly, yeah, lots of I'm sure lots of questions from the public as well will need to be dealt with. I understand where you're coming from. I I know where I'm leaning on this, but I think it'd be prudent on our part to reach out to any of the operators within our districts and get a little bit of feedback ourselves before mm -hmm. we make a final decision on it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just so you know, we did have. Uh, I think all of the operators that currently collect the levy were all included in our sessions and and a, f a few of the smaller ones that, that don't. So uh, it was actually in terms of per capita, Richmond County was, was well re represented in, in the sessions that we had. And there you have it, folks. That wraps up this week's edition of Roundtable on Talil Community Television. Thank you for tuning in, and a big thank you to my Talil colleagues for filming and formatting the Committee of the Whole footage you saw in this episode, Becky Borono, Nick Boudreau, and Callan Cowan. If you have any ideas for future editions of Roundtable, or you'd just like to comment on what you've seen here in this episode, feel free to contact me directly by phone or email, or to connect with Talil Community Television at the station in Arishat. And be sure to follow Talil on social media. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for tuning in to Roundtable. I look forward to seeing you again soon with a brand new show. Bye for now.